we'll just have to live with that. Well, it is 7.30, so uh, my technical difficulties aside, I would like to welcome everyone to the 801st regular meeting of the Civil War Round Table. Uh, we have with us tonight, as you all know, Ron Kirkwood, who will present on Too Much for Human Endurance, the George Spangler Farm Hospitals and the Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, despite the long uh, title, which is very specific, uh, Ron's book and his talk, I suspect, will take us uh, into uh, territory a little bit further than uh, just uh, the George Spangler Farm Hospitals. Uh, if I understand correctly from uh, getting into the background of his book, it will take us uh, into discussion of the farm itself and its overall role in the Battle of Gettysburg, which, which uh, uh, is, uh, uh, takes on an importance beyond uh, what, uh, what uh, uh, the medical uh, corps uh, did at, at the battle. Uh, Ron has a very interesting uh, insight into uh, the role that the, uh, the geographical placement, the Spangler Farm, uh, had uh, and its influence on the battle. Uh, before we get to that, however, uh, I would like uh, to give John Sebastian a few moments to make an announcement on the upcoming Chancellorsville and Pittsburgh <coughs> tour. We have not had uh, any announcements during this uh, uh, period of time when we've been interdicted or, or uh, assigned to quarters all these months uh, during uh, during, the, uh, uh, during the, the, the pandemic. So I wanted to give uh, John the opportunity to uh, let everybody know who's in uh, uh, on, the, on the meeting tonight, the details of the, uh, of the tour. So John, uh, take it over, please. All right, thank you, Mark. I appreciate that. And yes, I'm sorry that we haven't had quite communication like this through announcements at the meeting, something we realize we haven't been doing. But anyway, in regard to the tour, I just wanna let everybody know that as of now, um, yes, we are planning planning for the tour. I've had to postpone the, the dates, obviously, so it's not now. It'll be in late August. It'll be August 18th to the 22nd. Um, so hoping and praying things are better <laughs> by then. But we did go ahead and make that decision to postpone. The information for the tour has been uploaded onto the website. So there is a registration form there. It does have the information for the tour with the cost. Um, there's also a brief itinerary as well as the, the uh, reading lists I've already put up there on the website for those that are interested um, instead of just getting that at the time of the, the tour. So you'll find that information on the website. I want to thank Bruce very much for putting that up on the website for me. I'm sorry, Bruce, it took a couple times, but thank you for doing that. I really appreciate it um, and making that available. So if you haven't seen that or were questioning, the information is there on the website. So please feel free to go there and see it. We are going to Fredericksburg and to Chancellorsville. Uh, so we'll be spending time on both of those battlefields as well as some of the other sites like, um, Hartwood church and Kelly's Ford, uh, Salem church as well. So I think it's going to be a very good tour. We will have, uh, both National Park Service historians from the park, although the first one, Greg Mertz, just retired on this past Friday, actually. But uh, he will be our guide along with Frank O'Reilly um, for this tour. So the information is there on the website. You can just print off the, the form and send it to me um, is the best way to do it. Um, and we'll go from there. So that is that information. Thank you. Uh Thank you, John. And uh, yours truly has been out buying books for the book raffles. I always get excited about that kind of stuff <coughs> myself. So I'm, I've been looking forward to, uh, to that. So uh, without uh, further ado, uh, we will uh, introduce uh, Ron Kirkwood, who uh, will give us uh, something new and fresh about Gettysburg. When we thought that there wasn't anything more that we could learn about Gettysburg, we find that yes, there is. And uh, looking forward to your talk, Ron. Thank you, Mark. And yes, there really is. Now, let me um, get my see if I can get my PowerPoint shared with everybody. And let me know if it 
comes up Does everybody see that? I don't know. I see that. I see that uh, that color blue of the Cubs, which bothers me. <laughs> we have a White Sox fan, and I think Bruce I, is probably probably taken ill. He's probably have to go to the hospital. <laughs> I uh, I should have put a White Sox player up there. Well, Jack Brickhouse Gosh, used to about, announce the Sox games. So let's let's pretend that Jack Brickhouse is actually Harold Baines for for tonight's meeting. Okay. Well, he, Back in the day, he used to he used to uh, announce both Cubs and Sox. So Brickhouse is okay. <laughs> okay, he's okay. Just not Fergie. All right. Well, thanks so thanks so much again. And as as you folks, most of you know, since we've been talking, that um, my wife Barb and I have lived in Pennsylvania, pretty much next door to the battlefield of Gettysburg for 38 years. But we grew up in Southwest Michigan, and we have spent a lot of time in Chicago. Wrigley Field. I like the old Comiskey Park. We went there a lot. Shedd Aquarium, uh, Lincoln Park Zoo. And this was actually my favorite, the Museum of Science and Industry. I love the submarine. We, uh, as kids, listened to uh, Larry Lujak, WLS. I think I watched the Cubs more than I, I'm a Detroit Tigers fan, but I watched the Cubs more because WGN just broadcast them all the time. And I loved it. Fergie Jenkins, Ernie Banks, Ron Santo. So many great memories and they'll always be important to me. So Chicago means a lot to us. Now though, let's talk about Gettysburg and what I wrote about. As Mark said, I argued in my book that too much for human endurance, that George and Elizabeth Spangler's farm was the most important farm in the Army of the Potomac's victory at Gettysburg. So we're gonna look at that first. Then we'll discuss the two major hospitals on Spangler property, the Spanglers themselves and the last three days of Confederate Brigadier General Lewis Armistead's life, which were spent at Spangler. And I'm gonna mix in some information on the 82nd Illinois Infantry, which consisted as most of you probably know, mainly of German soldiers from Chicago. This was their hospital. This is where their wounded and dying at Gettysburg went. They went to the 11th Corps Hospital at Spangler. So now the map, you can see in gray on the map the George Spangler farm in 1863 behind the Union line. This farm is 166 acres, it's huge. And as you can also see, it dominates the countryside behind the line. It's close to the left flank, it's close to the center of the line, and it's close to the right flank over by Culp's Hill. Then there are the roads. Granite Schoolhouse Lane cuts through Spangler as shown by that blue arrow. Blacksmith Shop Road is marked by the blue X's. Both go directly to the battlefield and connect the Baltimore Pike and the Tawnytown Road, the two main arteries. With the Spangler Farm, Union commanders had the size, they had the location, and they had the roads needed to hold massive amounts of infantry and artillery in reserve right behind the line and then get those reserves to the line quickly and often just in time. This was a farm that could help win a battle. Here's a close up of the Spangler's farm and it shows how the Army of the Potomac uh, used their farm during the battle. Now, number nine on the map is the artillery reserve, which I'll get to in a minute. Number four is the first division, second Corps hospital at Granite Schoolhouse, which I'll also get to in a minute. Now, most of you are probably followers of Gettysburg, so you know very, very well the story of Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain and the 20th Maine and the other fifth Corps regiments that rushed to the area of Little Round Top and got there basically in time, just in time to save the day. But what most followers of Gettysburg might not know is that Chamberlain and the rest of the Fifth Corps got there so to Little Round Top so quickly because they spent the afternoon of July 2nd bivouacked on and next to the George Spangler farm as shown on the right of this map. So it was about five o'clock they got the call, get to the line. So part of the part of the Fifth Corps rushed down Granite Schoolhouse Lane you see in the middle of the farm. Part of them rushed down Blacksmith Shop Road to the Round Tops. 
they weren't gone long before the sixth car moved in there on the very same ground. And again, they weren't there long before they were ordered to the front and they rushed down Granite Schoolhouse Lane. Later on the night of July 2nd, a division of the 12th Corps up on Culp's Hill was ordered to the front and they rushed down Granite Schoolhouse Lane, got there just in time to help save, to prevent a Confederate breakthrough. George Meade had his main street at Gettysburg and its name was Granite Schoolhouse Lane. Now we're gonna talk a bit about the 11th Corps Hospital, that's at number 10 on the map. The 11th Corps Hospital had 100 ambulances attached to it, and they were in sh they're shown here in the Spangler's wheat fields. Now, when the ambulances were at Spangler, they were uh, usually on East Cemetery Hill, where most of the 11th Corps was stationed. They had infantry and artillery bivouacs on the west side of the farm, and then there's Powers Hill. Um, which you can see in the top center of the page. Most of Powers Hill, three fourths of it in fact, was owned by the Spanglers. The other fourth was owned by his neighbors, Nathaniel Leitners. There's a signal station up there with flags waving. There's more artillery up there. There's more infantry up there. General Slocum set up his 12th Corps headquarters on the top and on the bottom of Powers Hill. And Meade even gets involved on Spangler land on July 3rd when he's bombed out of the Leicester house on the Tawny Town Road, he retreats to the top of Powers Hill, Spangler's land to watch the rest of the battle. When the battle's over and it seems to be won, he returns to the line. Then that evening he returns to Spangler. And you can see where Meade's headquarters is marked. It's in a woods that are still there today. It's called the George Spangler Woods. It's right on the Baltimore Pike. That's where he sets up his headquarters and it's right next to the modern day General Slocum uh, headquarters marker. This photo shows one artillery battery. Now there were 19 of these artillery reserve light batteries crowding and overflowing Spangler land on July 2nd at about two o'clock. Each of the seven Union Infantry Corps at Gettysburg had their own artillery batteries, totaling about 200 cannons among the seven corps. These cannons though had to go where their assigned corps went. The artillery reserve adds 106 cannons, 2,300 men, 2,300 horses. That's another whole third of power. Plus the artillery reserve cannons based at Spangler on July 2nd and 3rd didn't have to go where an infantry corps went. These were the crucial utility players who could be counted on to perform well and be plugged in anywhere in the line that they were needed. And that's exactly what George Meade and artillery chief Henry Hunt did on the last two days of the battle. They rushed cannons from Spangler to the line, often with only moments to spare, and to, spare to prevent a Confederate breakthrough. So these guys left Spangler, they went to Wheatfield Road and they fought there. They fought on the Trossel Farm. They fought on the Plum Run Line. They fought all along Cemetery Ridge. They fought on the Kadori Farm. They fought on Cemetery Hill. They left Spangler and they fought on East Cemetery Hill. And they even fought on Spangler Land on Powers Hill. These horses, this is a well-known dual image of the 9th Massachusetts Battery Horses at the Trossel Farm who were all killed there in an intense fighting. Well, two hours before these horses were killed, they were at the George Spangler Farm. Other farms saw a lot more combat than the George Spangler Farm did at Gettysburg. And many of these farms were literally destroyed by it, but not one single farm played a greater strategic and logistical role with its two roads, with Powers Hill, and it's in the middle of it all location than the George Spangler Farm in setting up the Army of the Potomac vig victory in the biggest battle of the Civil War. Now the hospital. Go to SearsGarageDoors.com. The first division caught the heaviest of the blow. Many killed and wounded were the result and the latter were now being brought to the hospital in great numbers. Granite Schoolhouse surgeon in charge, Dr. William Warren Potter, 
57th New York. Now Granite Schoolhouse was built in the early 1860s when the Spanglers donated the land in the middle of their farm for it. On days two and three of the battle, there was a major first division, second corps Army of the Potomac Hospital in the fields and woods around this school. This hospital has received little attention since the battle and little has been revealed about it until my book came out. And I think that's a shame. It's just overgrown, unmarked land now with thorns and poison ivy that make it difficult to enter as shown in the photo at the bottom left on your screen. But this hospital hosted the first division, second corps wounded and dying men who fought at Rose Woods and the famous wheat field two absolutely crucial places on the battlefield. These were the fighters of the famous Fighting Irish Brigade. This was a division of Father Corby who went on to become president of Notre Dame. He gave the men general absolution moments before the day two battle, thus clearing their path to heaven. This was the Corps of General Winfield Scott Hancock. More than 1,000 men of the first division were casualties on just that one day of fighting and by the end of July 2nd, most of those wounded were either at the 1st Division 2nd Corps Hospital at the Granite Schoolhouse on the George Spangler Farm, or they were waiting to be taken there. Chaplain John Henry Wilbrand Stuckenberg of Erie and the 145th Pennsylvania served at Granite Schoolhouse. He said, our hospital was at the foot of Powers Hill I found the doctors and nurses busily engaged with the wounded, scattered around in all directions, some lying on blankets, some on straw, a few on stretchers, others on the bare ground. Private Erastus Allen of Company G, shot through the abdomen, suffered terribly. Some of the intestines protruded through the wound, and some of their contents would occasionally flow out, producing a horrible stench. It was very evident that our regiment had again suffered severely. Second Corps Ambulance Chief Lieutenant Thomas Livermore of New Hampshire made numerous deliveries to the Granite Schoolhouse Hospital on July 2nd. He said, here under the shelter of some boulders lay a large number of our wounded and dead who had been brought from the field. They lay upon the ground covered with their blankets and the living were nearly all silent, having fallen asleep from fatigue. Brigadier General Samuel K. Zook was treated at Granite Schoolhouse on July 2nd for a massive chest wound before dying in a house farther behind the line one day later on July 3rd. Now his wound opened such a gaping hole that a doctor could see the general's heart beating. The monument on the left of the page marks where General Zook was mortally wounded. Colonel Edward Cross, 5th New Hampshire, died July 2nd at Granite Schoolhouse after being mortally wounded on the opposite side of the wheat field from where General Zook was mortally wounded. Cross Avenue between Devil's Den and the wheat field bears his name. Colonel Cross was beloved as a great fighter in New Hampshire and by many of his men, but he was despised by others for his drinking and tantrums. His unit's Pioneer Corps called him a tyrant and they refused to bury him. The monument in the middle of the page is to Cross and his fighters. Lieutenant George A. Woodruff, 1st United States Artillery Battery I, was mortally wounded on July 3rd during Pickett's charge when he hit, was hit in the back while facing and directing his men on Ziegler's Grove. The son of a Michigan judge died at Granite Schoolhouse, telling his friends that he regretted being shot in the back and asking that it be no reflection upon his reputation. Most of the First Division Second Corps Hospital at Granite Schoolhouse was moved to safety farther behind the line on day three after 24 hours of intense service because it was getting hit by Confederate artillery overshots from the pre-Pickett's Charge cannonade. This is what the site of the school looks like today. The school was torn down exactly 100 years ago in 1921 and nothing remains of it except the foundation of the building 
which is buried under decades of growth. There is no sign there as there is for so many other division hospitals around Gettysburg and this fallen tree accidentally marks the site of the former school. The open fields where the wounded and dying men of the wheat field lay next to the school are now covered in woods and overgrowth. And the National Park Service has told me very specifically that it has no plans to clean up this site, which I find to be very disappointing. Now, this is the whole reason I originally started to write the book was the 11th Corps Hospital. One day cured me of a hospital. Give me the picket line every time in place of a hospital. Captain Matthew B. Cheney, 154th New York, after visiting the 11th Corps Hospital. The 11th Corps medical staffers picked the Spangler's Farm for a hospital on July 1st because of its proximity to the evolving front line and access to water, crops and livestock for food, buildings for hospital purposes, good roads, which we've already talked about, and wood for operating tables, tents, fires, and caskets. While the first division second Corps hospital used the school on Spangler land, the 11th Corps hospital used the Spangler's barn, summer kitchen, house, other outbuildings, and fields. Now Granite Schoolhouse hosted a division hospital. Um, around this barn here and around the buildings was a full Corps hospital with all three divisions of the 11th Corps treated at this one hospital. It was most common to have hospitals at Gettysburg broken up by division. George Spangler was 47 years old. Elizabeth Spangler was 44 during the Battle of Gettysburg. Their children, all of whom were living at home in 1863, were 21-year-old Harriet, 19-year-old Sabina, 17-year-old Daniel, and 14-year-old Benaiah. The six Spanglers were ordered by 11th Corps doctors on July 1st to leave for their own safety. But somehow they made a deal that they were allowed to stay in one room upstairs in their house, but they had to stay out of the way. So that bedroom is where they lived during the five weeks and two days that their home was occupied for a hospital. They could leave the room, but in doing so, they had to step over and around wounded and dying union officers just to get out of their house. Now the ambulance corps started delivering 11th Corps and other wounded to Spangler at about 4 p.m. on July 1st. At the hospital's peak attendance on July 4th and 5th, the Christian and Sanitary Commissions estimated there were about 1,900 wounded men there, including about 50 to 75 Confederates. Dr. Daniel G. Britton of Westchester, Pennsylvania, which is over by Philadelphia, the wounded soon began to pour in, giving us such sufficient occupation that from the 1st of July till the afternoon of the 5th, I was not absent from the hospital more than once, and then but for an hour or two. Very hard work it was too, and little sleep fell to our share. Four operating tables were going night and day. Many of them were hurt in the most shocking manner by shells. My experience at Chancellorsville was nothing compared to this, and I excuse me, I never wish to see such another sight. For myself, I think I never was more exhausted. This is where surgeries and amputations took place. Underneath the seven foot extension and on the front of the Spangler's barn called a four bay. There, doctors could have more light and fresh air away from the smells and crowds inside the barn. Surgeons worked here with their backs to the wall of the barn. <clears throat> A surgeon could finish an amputation in five to 15 minutes, depending on the limb, and then move immediately to the next one. No washing required <clears throat> of bloody or germ-infested hands or bloody equipment because they didn't understand how proper sanitation could prevent infection and reduce the spread of disease. A Spangler surgeon approaching total exhaustion called the work too much for human endurance. Private William Sollerton, age 19, 75th Ohio, said, at the doorway, I saw a huge stack of amputated arms and legs, a stack as high as my head. 
the most horrible thing I ever saw in my life. I wish I had never seen it. I sickened. Amputated limbs were loaded into a wagon or wheelbarrow and buried somewhere in a distant location on the farm. The amputations and surgeries and wounds attracted an infestation of flies that relentlessly harassed everyone. Pigeons in the barn added to the filth and hornets added to the pain. Then there were the maggots that covered wounds and stumps. Infections were expected after a Civil War surgery and the worst in infections could be smelled eight to 10, 10 feet away. So imagine the stench that greeted a hospital staffer or visitor in the barn or when entering a tent filled with eight to 10 men all suffering with infections. To help battle these smells, Spangler hospital workers cut branches off pine trees and hung them on the tents and they used them inside for bedding. <coughs> Excuse me. This is the Spangler's barn. It's a classic Pennsylvania bank barn. Uh, the style design was brought over by the Amish and the Germans in the 17 and 1800s. And here in South, uh, South Central Pennsylvania, it's the dominant design of a, of a barn. And I know it extends into Maryland, uh, Western Pennsylvania, some in Ohio, it goes down into Virginia. Um, but I think it's a classic. Uh, it's not only beautiful, but it's so practical. The extension on the front, the forebay, allows the farmer to, for more storage upstairs. And in the bank on the back of the barn, allows him to drive his wagon right up to the top floor of the barn for much easier loading and unloading. But during the battle, men were crammed so closely together in the Spangler's barn that it caused the spread of diseases. Some men died of these diseases rather than the battle wound that brought them to the hospital. All of this hospital was horrific. <clears throat> All of this barn was horrific, but it was the worst under the fore bay where the amputations took place and just inside that front wall in the stable. That's where many of the worst cases awaited their surgery amid cries of agony and smells of infection, body fluids and human feces. Cries and screams could be heard 50 yards away in the Spangler's house. Hospital workers covered their head with a pillow at night to try to drown out the sounds. Nurses read scripture <clears throat> and prayed with the men in an attempt to help send them on their way. Um, hundreds were lying with but feeble or in most cases with no shelter, exposed to, exposed to a cold incessant rain against the sides of the barn and in an orchard adjoining the sheds. Their moans were heard in every direction. And with a lantern, I moved about from one to another during the long hours of the night. I searched in vain for blankets to cover the suffering and the dying. <clears throat> Two female nurses played key roles at Spangler. Marilla Hovey and her 17-year-old son, Frank, traveled with her husband. Dr. Bleeker Lansing Hovey of the 136th New York, and she was always one of the first to reach the hospital during a battle. Unfortunately, no photos are known to exist today of Mrs. Hovey. The Hoveys are the only surgeon's family known to have traveled together during the Civil War. Mrs. Hovey nursed the wounded and wrote home to family members of the dead and the dying. She was able to go into sort of an autopilot mode and look past their terrible wounds and suffering and hold the hands of dying soldiers and talk to them in a desperate attempt to get their mind off their agony and their situation. In one letter from Spangler, Mrs. Hovey informed a family of their son's death and told them, I have had a good deal of care of him and called him my soldier boy and tried to take the place of mother, sister, and friend. I think I never had such a trial parting with one that I had no more acquaintance with. The Hovies worked at the 11th Corps Hospital for the fire. It was open. Then they went home to New York for three weeks to recover. Nurse Rebecca Lane Penny Packer Price, who's pictured there, was from Phoenixville, which is over by Philadelphia. She rode to Gettysburg on a bench in a railroad car, cattle, railroad cattle car in the middle of the night with donations shortly after the battle. Then she went to work as an unpaid nurse at Spangler. She said the sad scenes would fill a volume. 
So many times at night, I lay on my stretcher weeping instead of sleeping. Captain Augustus Vinos, 107th Ohio, was wounded on July 1st on what is now Barlow Knoll. Gangrene developed and his right arm was amputated above the elbow at Spangler. Mrs. Price nursed him from near death until he was well enough to take a train home to Canton, Ohio. He went on to marry in 1866, have nine children, many grandchildren, while amassing substantial wealth as a businessman. He was a pallbearer at the funeral of close friend, President William McKinley. Vinos carried Mrs. Price's photo for 40 years after the war. He often showed her photo to fellow ex-soldiers at national encampments in an attempt to find her and thank her, but without luck. Yet finally, in 1906, he received a letter. Dear sir, do you remember the tall nurse at Gettysburg who furnished you with clothing so that you could go home? She had found him. Vinyos replied that he looked forward to seeing her with great pleasure, and their reunion took place at a GAR encampment in New York State in 1906, 43 years after they met at the Spangler's Farm. This is my wife, Barb. Um, we spent a week up in Ithaca, New York at Cornell University. We went through 19 of these big, filthy, toxic boxes because we were looking for letters and diaries and interviews of the men of the 154th New York because those guys had doctors and patients at Spangler. I'm also grateful that we were allowed to go through it because after we were done, they closed this exhibit. Um, and you have to wear, it's so toxic that you have to wear a hazardous material suit now to enter to, to go view it. But anyway, on to Armistead and what those guys saw. Armistead began the final walk of his life in what would become known as Pickett's Charge on a seminary ridge farm of Henry Spangler. He would die two days later on the farm of Henry's half-brother, George. Armistead arrived at George and Elizabeth Spangler's farm at dusk on July 3rd, 1863, according to Dr. Henry Van Arnhem of the 154th New York. Armistead arrived at George's farm in an ambulance. He was removed on a stretcher and placed on the ground next to the ambulance and near the Spangler's barn. The 11th Corps Hospital Workers Private Emery Sweetland and Private Edson Ames of the 154th described Armistead's appearance as pretty bloody and covered with blood. Sweetland heard Armistead as he lay on the stretcher say, you have a man here who is not afraid to die. The Spangler's property was a shoulder to shoulder mass of chaos, agony and crying when Armistead arrived. Many wounded from Pickett's charge were pouring in as overwhelmed surgeons desperately tried to find who could be saved with immediate attention. Even so, the arrival of the Confederate general turned heads, and a large crowd of workers and gawkers formed around his stretcher, circling Armistead. The crowd was eventually broken up when Dr. Van Arnhem arrived at Armistead's side and ordered that he be carried away for treatment. Fellow Spangler patient, First Lieutenant, T.C. Holland of the 28th Virginia said he and Armistead were placed in the orchard. Lieutenant Holland said at one point under the trees that Armistead asked the doctors and nurses working around him to please don't step so close to me. Dr. Van Arnhem described Armistead as wild, nervous, flighty, saying war must cease, men of same blood, and he could not live. Spangler patient Private Justice Silliman of the 17th Connecticut described the 46-year-old Armistead as rather past middle age. Private Sweetland said Armistead had gray hair and whiskers. Dr. Kling, 
Jay Kling of the 55th Ohio said Armistead was suffering intense pain induced by the wound. Stimulants and painkillers were immediately given him. Dr. Britton took time to get to know Armistead, calling him a fine man, intelligent and refined. I had considerable conversation with him and was much pleased with his manners and language. Armistead died July 5th in the summer kitchen, which is that separate building to the right of the Spangler's house. Army of the Potomac Captain Frederick Stowe, the son of anti-slavery author Harriet Beecher Stowe of Uncle Tom's Cabin's fame, was his roommate in the building, which was reserved for VIPs. Stowe lived. Armistead was wrapped in a blanket, placed in a coffin made of wood from the Spangler's farm, and buried in their orchard. One month later, he was exhumed by an embalmer from Philadelphia, seeking to make money off his body. So Armistead was dug up after a month in a wood coffin. His body was embalmed in whatever condition it was in, and then he was reburied. His body was dug up one more time in October when relatives claimed him and reburied him in Baltimore. I found, confirmed, and listed the names, wound, and treatment of 1,436 Union and Confederate men at the Spangler 11th Corps Hospital and the names of almost 140 men who were buried in the Spangler's peach and apple orchards. The Union men were exhumed within a few months after the battle and reburied in Soldiers National Cemetery in Gettysburg, where Abraham Lincoln delivered the Gettysburg Address. Most Confederates other than Armistead lay in Gettysburg until 1872, when they were exhumed and reburied across the South. Armistead is one of five Confederates known to have been buried at Spangler. 50-year-old Colonel Eliakim Sherrill of the 126th New York died in the Spangler's house. His funeral in Geneva drew lines of people that stretched several blocks. His image is on the monument to the 126th New York in Ziegler's Grove. Assistant Surgeon William S. Moore of the 61st Ohio died at Spangler. Amazingly, he was the only Army of the Potomac surgeon or assistant surgeon to die at Gettysburg. But he left behind one-year-old and two-year-old children and young widow Sarah, who was so torn by grief that she mourned for the rest of her life and never remarried. Colonel Francis Mahler of the 75th Pennsylvania died in the Spangler's house. The Philadelphia City Council honored him with the resolution and they paid for his funeral. His brother, 2nd Lieutenant Lewis Mahler, died on the battlefield on July 1st at about the time and place of his brother's mortal wounding. Sergeant Nelson W. Jones of the 3rd Maine, 3rd Corps, died at Spangler after being hit in both legs in the peach orchard by an artillery shell. He died even though he made and applied tourniquets to his legs on the battlefield. He was 20 or 21 years old. Private George Nixon of the 73rd Ohio died at Spangler. He would be the great grandfather of President Richard M. Nixon. George Nixon was 40 years old when he entered the army as a poor man working on a rented farm. He left behind a wife and nine children when he went off to war, very likely enlisting only to make money to support his family. And if you look at his eyes in that photo, those sad, sad eyes, you can tell he's, he's, he doesn't want to do this, but he's doing it for the good of his family. Adjutant and First Lieutenant Joseph Heaney, age 21, 157th New York, died of a leg wound at Spangler. Nurse Price walked next to his stretcher and held an umbrella over him to protect him from the July sun as he was taken to the Spangler barn for an amputation. First Lieutenant Thomas Wheeler, 75th Ohio, age 25, spent almost a month at Spangler before he died of four wounds. His parents were at his side and Nurse Price sang Rock of Ages to him as he died. Many soldiers didn't always tell the whole story of the seriousness of their wounds in their letters home from Spangler because they didn't want their family to worry. Sergeant Henry Sees of the 82nd Ohio wrote this letter to his brother from Spangler. My leg was amputated just above the knee. I stood the operation very well, 
being under the influence of chloroform. I am very well cared for and in a fair way to get along well. I hope mother will not worry herself about me. But Sergeant C's died one week after he wrote that letter. Many died at the 11th Corps Hospital who were the lone source of income for their sickly parents back home. Many died at Spangler as teenagers. 19-year-old drummer Thaddeus Reynolds of the 154th New York was in such agony from lockjaw as he neared death that doctors put him under with chloroform so he could die in peace. Corporal Andrew Mayberry of the 20th Maine died at Spangler, leaving behind wife Hannah and five children ages six months to 11 months. One father arrived at Spangler one day after his son died. One wife arrived five days after her husband's death. They found out about their loved one's death when they arrived in Gettysburg. But the vast majority, by far the vast majority of 11th Corps hospital patients survived. They included Captain Alfred E. Lee of the 82nd Ohio, went home from Spangler with a hip wound, and when he arrived in town, he found his obituary in the newspaper. So then he walked in on his funeral. Brigadier General Francis Barlow spent a week at Spangler with three wounds that numerous doctors declared to be mortal, but he surprised all of them and lived, and it's thought that his wife, Arabella, attended him at Spangler. Corporal James Brownlee of the 134th New York survived seven gunshot wounds at the Brickyard on July 1st, one of which broke four ribs. He was shot three times through the bowels, and incredibly, he survived. Private Emil Geis of the 82nd Illinois was wounded north of Gettysburg on July 1st and taken to Spangler. His leg was amputated above the knee and he survived. Bugler A.H. Mignol of the 82nd Illinois had part of an arm amputated prior to Gettysburg and then he had more of it amputated at Spangler, but he too survived. This is a uh, part of the wounded list from the back of my book, I pulled out some of the 82nd Illinois guys from Chicago. And you can see, you can see the wide variety of illnesses. The 82nd Illinois had 23 wounded men treated at Spangler. Note the variety of wounds and illnesses, but the commonality of the use of water dressing as a treatment which basically meant covering a wound with a wet cloth and ointment. Water dressing was a treatment of choice at Spangler for 75% of the wounds there, no matter the wound and including for amputations. Again, this is just part of the list of 82nd guys that I have in the back of my book in one of the appendices. The 82nd's total, of 23 wounded at Spangler, places it 18th highest out of the 26 11th Corps regiments at Gettysburg. But it doesn't take into account the suffering of the high number of men taken prisoner north of Gettysburg on July 1st. Also, the 82nd was 18th out of more than 50 total regiments and batteries represented at the Spangler Hospital. The 26th Wisconsin from Milwaukee, <coughs> excuse me, had the most wounded men at Spangler with 135, and the 157th New York was second at 117. If you combine the number of wounded at Granite Schoolhouse with the number of wounded at the 11th Corps Hospital, the Spanglers hosted almost 3,000 wounded soldiers on their property, more than the entire population of Gettysburg of 2,400 at the time. And we can come back to that slide if anybody wants to later. The surgeons at Spangler were among the best of the best for their time, and they saved far more lives than they lost. And just like the soldiers, these surgeons were taken prisoner, they were wounded, they got sick, and they suffered. Many Spangler surgeons died in their 30s and 40s because of their exposure to disease, their horrifying work, poor food, long marches, and unsanitary camp life. 
I dug up in my book research the names of 15 head surgeons who worked at the 11th Corps Hospital, and most of them went on to leadership roles in medicine and their community after the war. <clears throat> and these men are three of my favorites. Spangler surgeon Dr. Henry Van Arnhem, 154th New York, was a passionate opponent of slavery who wanted full civil rights for blacks. He said, the curse of God visits on all that come in contact with this atrocious institution. Dr. Van Arnhem served four terms as a United States congressman, but unknown to Dr. Van Arnhem, his nephew and namesake, 22-year-old Captain Henry Van Arnhem Fuller of the 64th New York, was killed July 2nd in Rosewoods at Gettysburg while Dr. Van Arnhem worked nearby at Spangler. Dr. Van Arnhem constantly told his wife in letters home how much he missed her. Spangler surgeon Dr. Henry K. Neff of the 153rd Pennsylvania was captured at Chancellorsville, held prisoner for four weeks, and his health never recovered. He was sick with pneumonia as he cared for others at Spangler, and he remained sick after he was transferred to work at Camp Letterman later in July. He died not long after the war at age 45. Spangler surgeon Dr. Jay Kling of the 55th Ohio was captured by Confederate cavalry while on his way home and imprisoned for three months after being mustered out in Georgia in 1864. He filed a claim to the government for losses sustained and expenses incurred, but was denied because he was taken prisoner after he was mustered out. The 11th Corps wounded continued to be sent away until the Spanglers finally had their farm back on August 7th, at least what was left of their farm. George Spangler filed three damage claims totaling about $5,000 but the Spanglers only received $90 of it, and it's believed that that $90 went entire to the, entirely to their Washington, D.C. attorney, so they got nothing. The U.S. quartermaster's agent in denying the claim said, the government of the United States is no more responsible for bringing on the battle fought there than it would have been had a tornado passed over that country, causing as widespread destruction as did that terrible engagement. That battle and hospital damage was his misfortune. Now this photo at the top left is one of only three known photos of members of the George Spangler immediate family. This is of their youngest son, Benaya, his wife, Sarah, and their daughter, Mary Elizabeth. And Benaya was in family where they were living on and running the farm at this point. Uh, this was, photo was taken 25 years after the battle. You can see, oh, George and Elizabeth had purchased a small farm next door and moved there. You can see how well the Spanglers rebuilt after having basically a destroyed farm. If you look at the house, uh, you can see the porch on the front of the house. And as we look at it to the left side of the porch, everything to the left side of the porch was added after 1863. So the house, they had it a whole third a whole third to it after the battle when they rebuilt. To the left in front of the house is their smokehouse. I mean, yeah, their smokehouse. Uh, no refrigeration, no electricity. That's how they preserved their meats in the smokehouse. You can see the outhouse outside the picket fence. And then again, I mentioned the summer kitchen earlier where Armistead died. The Spanglers did not have a working kitchen in their house. They used the summer kitchen to keep the heat out of the house and uh, reduce the danger of fire. And in front of uh, the summer kitchen is a grape barber where they grew grapes and they did chores under there. And uh, a common tendency of these Pennsylvania bank barns of the Germans is to put all their sheds and other buildings inside the barn or between the barn and the house, as you can see there. Uh, the top photo at top right is of Daniel Spangler, the number three child. I was thrilled to find that. With, this is with his wife, Effie, on their wedding day in 1892. So now I have photos of the Spangler sons, Daniel and Benaya, but I'm still looking for their sisters and their parents. The photo at bottom right is the other known photo. This photo is from 1886 or 87 and is in front of Granite Schoolhouse and includes four members of George's family. This is where Mary Elizabeth attended school on her grandfather's farm 
just a quarter of a mile walk from the house. <clears throat> Benaiah is at the far left, marked by the blue X, looking like he just walked off the set of the movie Fiddler on the Roof. Um, Benaiah is in the photo because he was on the township school board. Daughter Mary Elizabeth is marked by the blue star. If you can see over that far to the right, I'm not sure. Clara Patterson is under the arrow and Alice Patterson is under the oval. They are the daughters of George and Elizabeth Spangler's second child, Sabina Patterson. In the front with his dog is little Raphael Scherfe. Um, the Scherfe's owned the peach orchard at the time of the battle. Raphael, sadly, his father was already dead by the time this photo was taken, but he grew up and did well anyway and became a prominent dentist in Gettysburg. In wrapping up, <clears throat> George Spangler was chairman of the Cumberland Township School Board when he donated the land for the school in 1861. He also was a church in Adams County leader, serving on several boards, including the Evergreen Cemetery Board that voted not to allow Confederate burials there. A teacher whom George hired said, Mr. Spangler proved himself to be a very efficient school official and made a lasting impression on my mind as a man of truthfulness and honesty in all things. Elizabeth Spangler took care of her widowed father in his later years and made sure he was buried next to her and George. The Spanglers took in a niece after George's sister Susanna died. All four Spangler children became productive adults. Harriet and Sabina married local farmers and worked hard and had families. Daniel moved to Kansas to use his carpentry skills in the growing new state and settled near Abilene around the time Wild Bill Hickok was marshaled there in the early 1870s. Benaiah worked the family farm for many years until he gave up farming and moved into Gettysburg at about 1890. As was common in family in those days, though, personal tragedy followed the Spanglers. George's daughter, Harriet, died two months after he died. Then Harriet's daughter, Annie, died a few days after her mother. So Elizabeth lost her husband, a daughter, and a granddaughter in a little more than two months. One of Daniel's two sons drowned in Kansas, and Benaiah's only grandchild died as an infant. That shows you what the barn looked like when the Gettysburg Foundation purchased the property in 2008. And I don't know if you can see the whole picture at the bottom right, but that's what it looks like now. It's It's been renaissanced. After an almost complete rebuild since purchasing the property, the Gettysburg Foundation now opens a farm to tours to visitors and offers programs and tours on weekends in June, July, and August, including this year during the virus, if anybody wants to come out and see. Please note, if you do make the trip out from Illinois, that most of the wood in that rebuilt barn was there in 1863 and is the same wood that the wounded and dying men lay on and next to. Some of that barn's wood dates to a log cabin barn that was built on the property in the 1700s. The Spanglers recycled that 1700s wood when building this barn. And I'm going to close with two thoughts from Spangler 11th Corps hospital worker, Private James R. Middlebrook of the 17th Connecticut. He wrote to wife Frances from Spangler, it is enough to make one's heart bleed to witness the amputations. I feel it my duty to do all I can for them. I cannot see them suffer and shall stay as long as I can stand it. Private Middlebrook survived until the end of the Civil War. And after nearly three years of service and all those battles and all that suffering and all that movement all over the East Coast, it was the fight in Gettysburg and his work in the Spangler Hospital that Middlebrook remembered most in one of his last letters home before being mustered out. He said, make up your mind to travel some when we get home, he wrote in July 1865. I think of going to that place long to be remembered, Gettysburg. Chicago, thank you so much for your time and your extra patience tonight. You went above and beyond the call of duty tonight with us. So thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, very good. Very nice, uh, Ron. Uh, that uh, interruption was unfortunate, but uh, you made a great comeback. <laughs> great comeback. 
Uh, Thank you, Mark. That shows Thank you, you how good how good you were. Uh, I think we, uh, in terms of the the, I, I don't know if these uh, couple chats here that I see are questions, uh, but uh, if they are, you should be able to see them yourself, and I would encourage you to just answer uh, any. If they are, if there are no questions, I have one. Which uh, has to do with damages uh, okay. that prop property owners uh, uh, made, but I, I don't know. Are, are are there questions in the, those chats there? I don't see them. I I, di I didn't see any. You're not seeing any. Well, then let me ask no, one uh, because I had the misfortune once of having my car stuck down by the by the Middle Creek, you know, west of Emmitsburg Road. I I got. Uh, too close to the creek, although I was on the road, uh, I uh, went, when, back, when backing up, I uh, went off the road into some very marshy land and got stuck so that I, uh, I uh, uh, had to get towed out. So in the meantime, I had a long talk with the property owner there who had uh, all the papers uh, from uh, the prior owners uh going all the way back, who had made claims because Biddle's Brigade got lost and, and uh, bivouacked on that property west of Emmonsburg Road. I don't know what the <coughs> local road is, Bullfrog Road or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and they made claims. It looks to me like uh, almost all the farmers around uh, and certainly on the battlefield uh, made claims. Are you aware that anybody uh, was ever compensated um, in any way or shape or form for their it losses? was a rare few i know that um george's brother-in-law john herps he owned the property where general reynolds was shot okay uh george's he was married to george's sister Susanna. so that was the herps woods that, so that was another spangler farm he got mm -hmm. a couple of thousand dollars i think from the state and i've heard of a couple of other farmers getting some money but it's kind of random um, it got so bad with everybody being turned down at Gettysburg, the civilians formed a commission, a committee, to explore ways that they could be reimbursed, uh, but it didn't help. It was just yeah. rare and few and far between that anybody received any money. Yeah, now, now the, the, all of these troops that, that gathered and uh, were, uh, because I mean, I'm, I think we all are well aware that... Uh, a lot of the reinforcing of the uh, southern part of the battle, the wheat field, the uh, round tops, etc., came from this area, uh, the marshalling uh, ground, and also the also I, I think if you correct me if I'm wrong, the 12th Corps uh, tramped back and forth across this area. Uh, did they not in reinforcing the uh, uh, in attempting to reinforce the left side of the line? Well, uh, the one division did. One division left Culp's Hill. And they right. went down Grand Schoolhouse yeah. Lane, and they helped so, out on the line. But another was, division got lost on the Baltimore Pike, and even though they were supposed to go to the front, they never made never, it. So. Yeah, never got there. So the no. question is, uh, uh, how how uh, how much damage was there to the farm? I mean, were there a lot of crops growing uh, all around the farm yes. there that were just yes. totally destroyed? Uh, all of his crops, he lost 100% of some of them. He lost 80% of some of them. Um, yet he, he lost almost everything. The army took his tools. The army didn't have... The army banned wagons, anything into town except military. So no hospital gear was allowed into town. So they didn't have bedpans. They didn't have shovels. They didn't have bedding to lay the guys on afterwards, except for the hay that the Spanglers provided. They didn't have hospital food for the guys. Um, so they took all of the farmer's equipment. Uh, they took all of the farmer's animals, obviously, and used them on um, however they would use them. Um, George bought thousands of dollars worth of wood. He was going to build a pig pen. They took all that. Um, the house. The neighbors, the Lightners, their house was used as a hospital too. And it was so bloody that when the hospital was done being used and the Lightners came back and they cleaned it up, they still couldn't use it because it made the, the wife sick. So that's how disgustingly hor horrible and horrific these houses were. 
So the Lightners left, but the Spanglers stayed through that fight for five weeks and two days in the hospital, and then they cleaned it up and they stayed. Somehow they they managed to put up with the smells, but their fields were all ruined, all ruined, and all of their their stone walls and their wood fences all ruined. Uh, they just and the armies, the surgeons would take uh, the citizens' clothing. They would take the girls' dresses and everything, and they would use it in the hospital. So they lost all that. The Spanglers seem to be, and I don't know where they got it, but they seem to be a family of means. And so they were able to rebuild. And now they had the sanitary and the Christian commissions there for the rest of the year. And so they would have gotten a lot of food and a lot of clothing and a lot of equipment from those two commissions. They had relatives in the area whose farms weren't impacted by the battle. And then there were Adams County farmers who just helped out, too, who weren't impacted. So they got a lot of help through the end of 1863 to rebuild. But I, I can't imagine that it probably took several years to, to get the farm back the way they wanted it. <clears throat> I, I see. I mean, one could, one could understand how the wheat field, for example... Uh, would have been ruined. There's a lot of back and forth there, the peach orchards, yes. uh, mm -hmm. and certainly the fields across which the uh, pickets charge units charged in other areas well, of the field. But but Spangler, Spangler's uh, farm was occupied for three days, and then, of course, uh, you know, was marched across and then utilized for weeks and weeks. Yeah. Was any other property as, as utilized, used, no. and marched That's over why. as much? No, that's why I that's why I claim and that's why I wrote. I didn't know going into this book I would find this, but I think it's by far the most important farm in the Battle of Gettysburg. Kadori Farm got beat up, Bliss got beat up, Henry Spangler got beat up, Rummel got beat up, but they didn't provide to George Meade what what George Spangler provided to him with his roads and with the hill and with this big property. Like if you look at that bottom photo all those trees in the distance, those weren't there in 1863. That was just an open field. So that's where you put the artillery reserve. And the ammunition train, which I didn't mention, where there's 100 wagons, artillery ammunition train, it lands on Spangler on July 2nd with 24,000 rounds, and it leaves a day later with only 4,000 rounds left. So that place was the logistical wheel. It all revolved around the George Spangler farm. And his brother, Henry, where Pickett's Charge started, where the Pickett portion of Pickett's Charge started, uh, his barn was burned down. Uh, his sister, Susanna, over on where Reynolds Woods nowadays, her barn was burned down. Um, Bliss, the Bliss barn was burned down. So that was common out there. At least his barn didn't burn down, although he yeah. took a lot of Confederate overshots on July 2nd and 3rd. I don't know if we have any questions from any uh, anyone else. I'll uh, put this slide up in case. Yeah, I don't, I don't want to do all the talking here. <laughs> in case anybody's interested in the book, it's out. Hardcover is almost sold out, but there are a few left. Paperback just came out and is out on audio and it's out on Kindle. So I'm very grateful to say it's been doing well. And um, if anybody wants to email me, I'll, uh, I'll personalize a copy and, and send it to them as well. And it's on sale all over Gettysburg. Publisher Savas Beattie. Amazon, Walmart, Barnes and Noble, Books a Million. Uh, the audio is on Audible and Sabbath Speedy. I guess it helps the publisher the most if it's purchased directly from the publisher. But I'm pleased that it's it's offered, you know, pretty much everywhere online. Yes, we we've, we've seen it everywhere. I I, I uh, I've uh, I've been in touch uh, uh, with Sabbath Speedy. Now we we do have a question from Bruce about are are, are any Spangler descendants uh, uh, alive today? Oh yeah, I'm, I've been having a lot of fun with that. I I didn't include them 
in the book, but I found a lot in the past year. Then Daniel, the one who moved to Kansas, I've been talking with his great grand, uh, George and Elizabeth's great grandson. He's Daniel's grandson. And I'm going to go out to visit him in Kansas because he thinks he might have some photos of the farm from back in the day. So I want to go check those out. And we have, I've probably been in contact and found 13 Spangler descendants through three of the four kids. Benaya doesn't have any now because his granddaughter uh, didn't have any kids that lived. But yeah, there are a lot of them around and they're all over the country. There's a lot of them in Kansas. There's a lot of them in Gettysburg. And a lot of them in Gettysburg did not even know that they were descended from this farm. They've lived here their whole life and didn't know. So now we're going to have a busy and fun summer at the farm as the descendants all show up to see, see their ancestral home. That'll be fun. That's pretty interesting that they don't yeah. know their heritage, the even though they live in the town. The vast majority. The first ones coming out will be early June from Kansas. His name is Calvin Spangler. And he's uh, George and Elizabeth's great-great-grandson. Very interesting. So they're excited. And I'm excited to meet them and show them around their home, their ancestral home. Well, I can say this much. I've always felt that when we go to Gettysburg generally, not, not so much, you know, on a, on a uh, round table tour because all of us have been there with Ed at least once, uh, some of us three, four times uh, or more. Uh, may he rest in peace. Uh, we do spend some time on, you know, the Culp's Hill side, but of course we've never really been to this site at all. We we could arrange a, a nice tour of the George Spangler farm and we could show you um, where all of the other important Spangler farms are too, but especially the time would be spent on this one. And um, Spangler Spring obviously was Abraham Spangler and that's George Spangler's dad. I and they were, both, they were both presidents at various times of the Cumberland Township School Board. So that was a big family on education. Yeah, it's... Yeah, we, it's uh it's very interesting that these family names uh, spread out over town. It's very similar to what one sees at Antietam, for example, with all the Poffenbergers. Uh, really? Uh, and, and in fact, you, you see the Poffenberger names up and down, up and down the, the, the road between uh, uh, Hagerstown, for example, and, and, uh, and Sharpsburg. I recall even asking Dennis Fry, who was our guide when I was, when I was, president last and we did did a tour of Antietam. I asked, are you related to any of these people? Because he's a he's a Church of the Brethren member. Uh, and he said, Oh yeah, we're all we're all we're all related. So the Spanglers are all related to them. They are. I'll show you a map from the book. That map at left. Those are all uh you see George at the bottom and right. Dad Abraham had two farms. Henry had a farm, and then John Herps, where Reynolds was shot. So those, all of those farms were involved in the battle. And then there were some other of uh, George's uh, siblings out by uh, the cavalry battlefield, the Day 3 cavalry battlefield, too. So, I see. Yeah, the only one I knew, quite honestly, was the, the Spangler Woods there west of the, west yeah, of the Emmitsburg Hen Road. Henry, uh-huh. Yeah, that's, I mean that's that, that's that comes up in all accounts of uh, yeah. Armistead started his pick his charge in those woods. He yeah, was on was, Henry in Henry's woods, and he ended yeah. up in George's. And it comes up. Kid. It comes up in accounts of the second day battle too, because there were sure. federal skirmishers out that way and uh, yeah, etc. But the Spanglers uh, look like the Poffenbergers of Gettysburg. <laughs> uh, uh, it's very yeah. very uh, very interesting, but. That side of the battlefield, uh, I when I'm there by myself, is someplace I like to tramp around, but mainly east of the Balmer Pike, not, not so much Powers Hill or anything, because uh, there, there's the visitor center there now, of course. But yeah, uh, other than that, we don't we don't see that. The next time we go to Gettysburg, which I don't know when that will be, we will have to uh, 
include that. There's now more to see on Gettysburg than there used to be. Yeah. Because of course we have the first, the first day museum over there at uh, Seminary Ridge, which uh, we saw the last time we were there in 2014. But uh, yeah. so it's, it's been a while. So now there's another site to see. As I mentioned, well, in my, it, it mentioned initially, you know, we, we, we always think that we've, we know everything there's to know about Gettysburg, but uh, I think we were wrong about that. And they left, the, the historians left this one for me. So I'm grateful for them for leaving yeah, the story good, for good, me to, good for that. Uh, to dig it up. So Yeah, you don't need to win any more Pulitzer Prizes at the Harrisburg uh, <laughs> Patriot, do you? No, I'm good. I'm happily retired. <laughs> and I only lucked into it is because I started volunteering out there in 2013 and I kept finding more and more things that had happened there and I'm asking around, where's the book? Why isn't there a book on this place? And they said there wasn't and you should write it. So I said, okay. And I wrote it three years later. I well, thought it was I thought it was going to be a 100-page book on a hospital. And well, they, must one, they must love you for that. Uh, yeah, I guess. Well, they should. They certainly should. I know we do. Uh -huh. uh, thanks. Well, <laughs> I know that you folks are the most patient group I've had because I've never had to have a group wait that long as I tried to get my Wi-Fi back working. So thank you again for that. Well, hey, it's a, fri it's a Friday night, uh, Friday night in... Uh, in Chicago. Well, I don't know if you've been to Chicago recently, but uh, uh, you mentioned the, uh, the submarine, but there have been vast changes at the Museum of Science and Industry. The submarine exhibit, it's not your father's submarine visit anymore, the way it was when I took my children. It the is. Way I remember it. It's, uh, yeah, it was just outside and you go outside yeah. and you go, no, it is no longer. That it is a phenomenal. It's a whole wing uh, inside, and it's uh, it is a phenomenal exhibit now. Uh, okay. it, it's worth the trip to come to Chicago okay. and, and and see it. I I recommend it highly. I've seen. I've been there. I've been to it twice, and uh, it's 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 an amazing uh, it's an amazing exhibit. Now I'll I'll have to take my grandkids there. Yeah, yeah, they, 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 it's, they it's, it's 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 arranged beautifully. A big long ramp where you go down, down, down into it. Uh, a lot of artifacts. I don't know if they're all from that submarine, but they're period uh, artifacts, etc. Uh, I, I, I'm sure, I'm sure they they just love it. It's a it's a damn German submarine for Christ's sakes. <laughs> <laughs> but it's all inside now. It isn't just something you walk okay. outside and walk through. It's okay. far superior. If I loved it then, I can't imagine how great it must be. Oh now. yeah, no, no, it's uh, it's making me want to go down there right now. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> but anyway, I I, I I will solicit any more questions uh, uh, that we may have. If not, uh, we'll let we'll let uh, it's late it's later uh, where Ron is, uh, so we'll let him go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's my fault. Well, we're up uh, this late. Well, yeah, I, I uh, well that and I will uh, I will thank you on behalf. Of, uh, on behalf of the group, and before we sign off, uh, we will uh, let everybody know that next month uh, we will have Michael Hardy, a very nice gentleman from North Carolina. Uh, you all should check out his website. He's a very interesting uh, uh, gentleman. Uh, he's going to uh, talk on General Lee's Immortals. Uh, he uh, he, uh, he does some fascinating work down at, I believe he's a junior college uh, teacher, but uh, uh, it's been a while since I've checked out his website. Uh, it's been some, some months. Uh, so uh, let's, uh, let's look forward to that. And again, uh, Ron, uh, we'll, we'll look forward to seeing you. If you're ever in the uh, Chicago area, please look us up, any of us or all of us. I'd love to. Uh, and we'll, uh, we'd love to get together with you just to see you just to say hello or or more than that so i uh, that, i actually have five or six presentations on this farm they're all different maybe someday i can send you what they are and we can get together in person when my wi-fi won't uh, mess us up oh no we're looking at we're, we're looking at uh, we have we have uh, speakers lined up certainly for next year and a few for the year after that but we could uh, we we have we have no problem whatsoever uh, looking at a couple years out, 
because uh, that's what we're working on now. So no, no, we're we'll uh, you're uh, you're in our Rolodex. <laughs> we'll have you on speed dial. <laughs> I'll uh, I'll I'll send the list to you, and maybe okay. we can work something out down the road. It'd be fun to see you all in person. Yes, this year has been a funny year. Uh, I, 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 you know, I, I, it's two sides of the same coin. Uh, I, I don't regret not having to drive up to Milwaukee and back because usually that's the uh, president's job to to take the speakers up to Milwaukee and back. On the other hand, uh, it's fun to have uh, long chats with the uh, historians, with the speakers, uh, while doing that. And and so on the one hand, uh, I don't miss getting home late on Thursday nights. Uh, uh, but on the other hand, I miss, you know, I miss all the information I get from, from our speakers about their lives and their work. Uh, yeah. I would, I would truly enjoy, uh, having had the chance to talk to you about your, your career. My son teaches journalism at the university of Denver. He went to wow. Syracuse to the Newhouse school. So, uh, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, so, uh, we, we will definitely have you back, uh, a couple of years down the road. We're filled up for next year. I know. But uh, sounds good. I think everyone would love to love to see again. And, and there's, there's it, it, again, uh, I don't want to beat the subject to death, but uh, there's obviously more to mine at Gettysburg than than what we uh, than what we think. So uh, we'll we'll uh, we'll look forward to that. If unless there's okay. any more questions, I will I will sign off. Uh, but uh, please speak up if you if you have a question for Ron. If not. Uh, we'll see you uh, uh, next on May 14th uh, when you can uh, listen in on uh, Michael Hardy's talks on uh, on General Lee's Immortals. Thanks, everyone, for listening in. It was a great program. Uh, I've done a lot of reading on this book uh, in anticipation for the talk. I've not read the book yet, but now I, I generally read the books after, uh, af if I've not already read them, I read them afterwards. And so now... Something else uh, has to pile up, is going to pile up next to me. Thank you, yep. Ron. Good luck with it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you All very right, much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Good night.